Welcome back folks. It's time for our next 22 Nosgar video. This will be the third video we've done in this series. The basics of it are we're taking six millimeter Hager brass. We are necking it down and bumping the shoulder back a little bit with a 22 nozzler sizing die. And then we're shooting it in our 22 nozzler with a 6.8 SPC bolt or a 224 Valkyrie bolt. And the goal here is brass life because the standard 22 nozzler that uses the standard 223 bolt face is nearly impossible to reload for because the case heads get chewed up by the ejector and extractor. So, so far so good here on our first two firings with the 22 Nosgar brass. Our case heads still look great. Now in these first two videos, we found a bullet that my gun really, really likes. It's the 55 grain Nosler Varmageddon. We are shooting some outstanding groups with these guys. So the plan for today is to load up more of these and try and get some better velocity because we've been lagging a little bit behind on velocity in the previous videos because, you know, we're just trying to take it easy. First of all, I only have 30 pieces of this 22 Nosgar brass, so I don't want to do something stupid and damage the brass. We've also been shooting a wide variety of bullet weights. 22 nozzler low data in general isn't widely available. Alliant and Hodgton are really the only two sources we've got. This six millimeter Hager brass has a good bit less case capacity than standard 22 nozzler brass. So a lot of different things to be careful about and that's what we've been doing. So of course that hasn't stopped the jackasses in the comment section from showing up and giving us a lecture about how if you're shooting 223 velocities, then what's the point? Well today, finally, hopefully we're gonna get these velocities up. And honestly, we probably shouldn't pay much attention to those people anyway because if they're too stupid to look at a picture like this and realize that the 22 nozzle with its 15% more case capacity is about what I measure and with this Hager brass it's like 11 and a half percent more than 223 so if you're not able to realize that that's probably going to lead to some better performance well I think you might just be a moron all right let's move on another thing I just brought it up briefly in the video but it generated quite a few comments I mentioned that the Starline 6.8 basic brass was too short to use for forming 22 Nosgar. See, this is their basic brass with no marks on the case head. I don't know why that's creepy. It kind of creeps me out. It's like in a horror movie when they show a face with nothing on it and it's all creepy. I kind of get that same feeling looking at this, uh, at this basic brass case head. So a lot of people were saying that I was wrong, that it's not too short. Once you form a shoulder and a neck, it's going to stretch. It's going to draw it out. Well, in this case, that's just not how it's working out. Here's a lineup of the basic and then this short little guy with the super short neck. That is a piece of basic that I I formed into 22 Nosgar. And you can see it right there beside our good Nosgar case, not even close. Now I'm not faulting your logic, those of you who mentioned that it should be long enough, because I thought the same thing, that's why I bought this basic brass. I thought for sure that the forming process would lengthen it rather than shorten it. I think maybe if, you know, if we were pushing that shoulder a lot farther down the case, then we might start seeing that stretching action of the neck drawing out. But with the shoulder forming right at the top of that basic, it's just, uh, yeah, it's not stretching. It's not long enough. I posted a plea to Starline over on Instagram to see if maybe they could just produce some of this that's a little bit longer. I know that's probably a much bigger deal than it sounds like. And I'm sure these basic cases and the length of these basic cases are set as being just right for their 6.8 SPC brass manufacturing, I'm assuming probably. So it's probably not that easy to just, you know, make them a little longer. It's not like they're chopping them off this short and they can just chop them off a little longer. We'll just have to see where it goes. I know over on uh, Instagram, some guys also mentioned that the 30 Remington could also use a longer uh, basic option. So maybe between 30 Remington and those of us shooting 22 Nosgar, that's enough of a market to get Starline's interest. I don't know. We'll just have to wait and see. Okay, so moving on to today's video, we're gonna shoot the 55 grain Nosler of Armageddon, and I pulled out three powders that I think might give us some velocity. I think maybe at least one of them will be a dud, but there's only one way to find out. The Hodgton data and also the Alliant data, they show the highest velocities with CFE 223. So this is gonna be our first powder. They show, Hodgton shows a max charge of 33.5 grains. So I wanna shoot 33 and 33.5. Now we gotta keep in mind that 33.5 grain max is with 22 Nosler brass and we have less case capacity than that but the Hodgson data was shot at a 2.260 inch overall length and we're shooting a 2.300 inch overall length so less case capacity should raise the pressure but our longer overall length should reduce it a little bit or something like that right hopefully we're uh, not going to get ourselves into trouble and at 2.3 inches we're still like 80 thousandths off the lands or something so we got a little bit of bullet jump so I'm hoping we'll be okay with that max charge 
The next powder I want to try, this is the one that's most likely to be a dud and just give us low velocity. I don't know. It's Alliant Power Pro 2000 MR. I don't have any low data for this whatsoever. So we're just making it up. But I think, I'm hoping, it's a situation where we can't really get enough of this into the case to blow our face off. So what I basically did was just measured out how much I could fit in a case while still seating a bullet, which the number I came up with was about 35.5 grains. So that's what we're going to shoot. We're just going to shoot a big old case full of 2000 MR and see what happens. How's that for safe reloading practices? We'll shoot 35 and 35.5. My history and experience with this powder in other cartridges makes me feel uh, at least a little bit reasonably safe with doing this sort of bonehead load data. The last one I want to shoot is IMR 4451. This is a great powder that we've shot a lot in 6.5 Creedmoor. I think we've shot it some in 224 Valkyrie. It's a little bit faster burning than H4350. And if you go back to Nosgar video number one, we shot H4350 starting at 60 grain bullets. So I'm hoping that maybe 4451, a little bit faster burning perhaps, we might still have enough case capacity to get up to some good velocity with the 55 grainer with 4451. I don't know. Now, Hodgson has low data for this powder with 60 grain bullets. They show a max charge of 32.7. Well, I was measuring it out, and with our seating depth and stuff, I can't go much farther than that before we start getting kind of compressed. And if you've watched the previous videos, you'll know that we're having all sorts of trouble seating these Nosler Varmageddon bullets. The seating stem in my bullet seating die doesn't fit it well, and we're marking it up, and I'm afraid that if we go compressed, the bullet damage is just going to be bad. So we're shooting up to 32.5 grain grains with this powder. That's two tenths below the maximum charge with the 60 grain bullet, right? So we've got a little bit more room to work up. If we get our bullet seating straightened out and we feel like we can start running some compressed loads without damaging our bullets, we might be able to go faster. But here for the first try with 4451, we're going to shoot 32 and 32.5 grains and just see what happens. If the velocity is nowhere close to where we want to be, then we can just forget about this powder and move on to something else. If it's looking pretty good, then we can try and start compressing it and seeing if we can keep pushing it. So it's kind of the same story. 2000 MR and 4451, pretty slow burning. I'm feeling pretty comfortable about shooting the loads with these guys. All right, is there anything else to talk about? Our brass, of course, is the six millimeter Hager brass that was sent in by Justin. He formed these guys up and sent them to us to play around with. So far, so good. See, our case heads are looking great after a couple firings. As you can see, this guy's already primed with a Federal GM205M primer, which means the cases have been resized. I tumbled them and I went ahead and annealed them just like I did in the last video. Same exact process. All these guys have been annealed. None of them needed trimmed and I hit that case mouth with a little chamfer to make sure that our bullets get started easily. So we're ready for powder and bullets here. I figured we spent enough time on case prep in the last video. This one, we'll just jump forward and get right to it. So let's get started. All right, so I'm starting out with our charges of CFE 223. And I'm taking this opportunity to, to evaluate some scales here. I need to film an updated electronic scale video. I picked up several more from Amazon. I've got a Lyman, I've got a Hornady that I've all kind of collected over the last uh, six months or so. And I really need to make a video updating my recommendations when it comes to cheap digital scales. Now, unfortunately, this one that you see me use a lot, which was available on Amazon about a year and a half ago, they updated the design. And the new ones, this guy right here, for example, functions a whole lot differently. They operate the same. They just, like, they totally changed the brains in these guys, which is really unfortunate because the old version was awesome. And I went ahead and picked up the Lyman because I had really high hopes. This is a, a pretty darn affordable scale, and it comes with a better pan and a little powder scoop. And, like, it, it comes with better accessories for reloaders. But the early results with this guy are a little bit shaky. So that's kind of what I'm doing here. This isn't a scale video, so I'll, I should shut up now. So I'll just see you guys over at the press. Okay, before we start seating bullets, let's talk about seating stems. Up to this point, we've been using a Hornady custom grade bullet seating die, and I have two 22 caliber seating stems for that. I need to see if they've got any more 22 caliber options. I think they do. So those are the two stems, and if we take our bullet, both of these are just really, really bad matches. Like very little contact between the seating stem and the ogive of the bullet. Over with this guy, it's even worse than that one. So that's the root of the problem here with this bullet is our seating stem is just a terrible fit. But I pulled out the standard RCBS seating die from my RCBS kit. And if I pull out this seating stem, it is a much better fit 
It's not quite perfect, but it's much better than either of those two Hornady options. So today we're gonna to switch bullet seating dies. We're gonna use the good old standard RCBS seating die. See if that helps our situation. I think it will. Tell you what, the light kit I put on this press is a little bit too intense for, uh, for filming. I'm gonna to need to either modify it to get rid of some of the LEDs or something, cause it's, yeah, it's just a little too intense. Eh, let's see, we need a shell holder. Okay, there's our shell holder. This is a taper crimp seating die. It's got a taper crimp in there. So I don't remember exactly how the instructions say to adjust it, and I'm too lazy to pull them out right now. But if we run a case up into the die and then screw down the die until we feel that taper crimp hit the case mouth, I think this is exactly the way they say to set it up, but pretty universal instructions. You screw it down until you feel the, until you feel the, the crimp touch, and then let's back it out about a turn just to make sure our crimp isn't gonna interfere. Man, that is insane. I may just have to go light off. Yeah, let's just go light off. Then maybe brighten up the picture a little bit. Yeah, see, now that's much better. Now, if it wasn't for filming, I definitely recommend getting lights on your press and going that route, but if you're making YouTube videos, it gets a little bit annoying. So, let's see. Put a bullet on this case and run it up into the die. Doesn't feel like we're touching the seating stem or the seating stem isn't touching our bullet, I should say. So let's drop it, bullet might fall out. Yep, now will go down a couple turns here. We've got a long way to go and seat it. See what that gets us. And we're still a mile long. Our target is 2.300. So let's just crank on it until we start getting close. So that last adjustment, I was about 50 thousandths too long still. So I wanna go ahead and bring my lock nut down here where it's close. That might actually be pretty close right there. 2.341, looks like this die goes about 40 thousandths per turn. So I think that right there is gonna be just about perfect. 2.306, that's pretty close. I'll seat a couple more before I make any adjustment. The next one is 2.301, and the third is 2.302. So let me just tweak it down just a touch. That might've been just a little bit too far, but that's okay, because remember 2.3 inches is our maximum magazine length. So I would rather be one or two thousandths too short rather than one or two thousandths too long. All right, so these first five, our shortest one is 2.398, and the longest is 2.301. So that's, that's close enough. Now the first ones I'm seating are with CFE-223. This one isn't terribly compressed. Yeah, I'm still feeling just a touch of powder shaking here with our max charge. So at this point, we're not gonna have to worry about the overall length stretching at all. And I think with this second annealing, we've got these cases nice and soft now. They are seating extremely easy, like very, very smooth. And with this RCBS uh, die so far, no marks whatsoever on the bullet. Here's the first of our PowerPro 2000 MR loads. I'm not feeling powder moving, so I think we're pretty close to a full case, but the overall length hasn't changed. That's what I was hoping for. Like I gauged about where I thought the base of the bullet was, and here with PowerPro 2000 MR and IMR 4451, I tried to come up with a charge weight that was gonna be you know, right at 100% case capacity or maybe just barely compressed. And it seems like I did a good job. Yay me. Yep, this next charge with PowerPro 2000 MR, I think we're getting a little bit more compressed. This guy, 2.306. The first one was 2.304. So I'm gonna go ahead and run the bullet seating die down just a little bit and run these guys back through just to try and keep our overall length consistent. Yep, that still wasn't enough. Tweak it down a little bit more. This PowerPro 2000 MR, is a, you know, it's a spherical powder and it compacts down into that case really well. So once it starts compressing, I mean, it's really compressed where, you know, a, an extruded powder like IMR 4451, where the granules will crunch a little bit and give, that doesn't happen so easily with the spherical powders. Tell you what the great news though, is these bullets are looking fantastic, like absolutely perfect. So that's great news for the RCBS seating stem. Yep, got these guys just about perfect. So now moving on to IMR 4451, I wanna back that seating die out just a smidgen to make sure we're not too short. So here's the first one. Didn't really hear any crunching. I'm not really feeling powder move though. Overall length on this first one here is perfect, 2.299. All right, now here's our last load. 
Yep, that guy did crunch just a touch. And our overall length immediately jumped up a little to 2.304. Seat a couple more and make sure that's a, that's a trend. Yep, a little bit of crunching. And that one's even longer at 2.308. So down on the seating die a little bit. Yeah, just about perfect. 2.298 here. There was another one that was 2.301. So that's the setting for our max charge. So that's pretty much it, folks. I've got a feeling we're going to shoot some small groups today. The weather out there is nice and everything, so let's go ahead and get out to the range. Okay, folks, it is time to get started. Please ignore the gigantic blaze orange lab radar chronograph. Today's my first day on the range with it. I don't trust it as far as I can throw it at this point. These guys have difficulties with suppressors, and I'm still trying to learn how it works. So it could be weeks before I ever do a video on the lab radar. But I've got a setup today. We're going to collect velocity data with it and with the Magneto Speed V3. The Magneto Speed will be our primary data collection method. But if anything weird happens, we'll have the lab radar to hopefully back it up as long as the stupid thing will read. We're shooting at 100 yards. The dots down there are one inch in diameter. Our gun features an Odin Works 18 inch, one and eight twist barrel. Like I mentioned, we've got our Magneto Speed Chronograph uh, strapped to our Silencer Co. Omega Suppressor, six to 24 power Vortex Strike Eagle Scope, a LaRue MBT Trigger, Magpul PRS Stock, and I think that pretty much covers it. So let's get started. I did fire a couple rounds through the gun to get it warmed up. I shot three of them, so it should be ready to go. First up, CFE 223, 33.0 grains. Let's see if these things will group. Holy crap, that's a good start, 3448. Let me run down that piece of brass. Yeah, so our primer is a little bit flat, but our case head looks outstanding. It looks great, and I don't see anything else going on. So let's go ahead and shoot them. Okay, so after that first shot, the velocity settled down quite a lot. The last shot was also above 3,400 feet per second, but we dipped as low as 3,351. So yeah, 3,392 average and a really gross 37.9 feet per second standard deviation. I got to be honest with you, CFE 223 just does this crap sometimes. A lot of these spherical powders do. I can never seem to get good standard deviations with them. All right, so the rest of the brass looked just as good as that first piece. So let's go ahead and move on. 33.5 grains is next. All right, that was 35.19. All right, so we got a little bit of an ejector swipe, but it doesn't really seem to have raised up a burr or anything. Otherwise, looks okay. Let's go ahead and shoot them. All right, so for some reason, that last shot spiked all the way up to 3,640 feet per second. It blew the primer out and it completely destroyed the brass. And it looks like a couple of those shots, the brass is not in great shape. So definitely found the max with CFE 223, 3552 average and 134 feet per second extreme spread. A lot of that spread was that last shot. Okay, moving right along to Alliant Power Pro 2000 MR. So I did get the primer out of the action, by the way. I dropped the magazine and it, and it fell out. So that's always good. All right, moving right along. Alliant Power Pro 2000 MR. First up is 35.0 grains. May God have mercy on our souls. All right, that was 3416. And that primer looks less flattened than any of the CFE 223 loads. So hopefully our pressures are a little bit more under control here with 2000 MR. Let's see if they'll group. Ah, last shot went to the right. Crap, almost a good group. Okay, the rest of the brass, a few little ejector marks and stuff, but I think we're good to proceed. 35.5 grains is next. Let's see what this first piece of brass looks like. Yeah, 3494, a little bit of an ejector mark, but no burrs raised up or anything. Let's go ahead and shoot them, see if we, see if we can get ourselves in trouble again. That last group, I was really encouraged by 
the standard deviation number, 16.4 wasn't bad. Our extreme spread was 35. So it seems like much more predictable velocities here with 2000 MR. Let's see if that trend continues. All right, so got some more distinct ejector marks on the brass that time, but we didn't we didn't gouge them like we did with CFE 223, so that's a good thing. Outstanding standard deviation 9.7, extreme spread of 24, 3502 feet per second out of an 18 inch barrel. This is kind of pretty insane. I wouldn't want to shoot these all the time, right? We need to back off. These are crazy. But it looks like a nice smooth 3,400 feet per second load will be no problem whatsoever. Really good stuff. All right, moving on, IMR 4451. First up, 32.0 grains. All right, I told you there was probably gonna be a dud. I thought it was gonna be 2000 MR, but the numbers were crazy with it. Our first shot here with IMR 4451 was 2,923 feet per second. So yep, probably not a good velocity choice. I went ahead and ran down that first piece of brass just for the heck of it. And of course it looks fine. So eh, let's at least see if they'll group. Okay, last up, 32.5 grains of IMR 4451. All right, folks, so we got some halfway decent groups down there. So let's get packed up, head back to the bench. All right, folks, let's start out by assessing the carnage. Yeah, we definitely tore up some brass today. Let's flip it this way and go row by row. This first row was our first charge with CFE 223, 33.0 grains. Velocity was 33.92. And the factory ammo 55 grain velocity, I'm pretty sure it's 33.50. So this was just a little bit faster than what we should see with factory ammo. Definitely did see some slight ejector smearing there. Nothing terrible. Primer's not too flat. Here's a second piece, similar sort of deal. So at this point, I was feeling pretty good about CFE 223. I mean, other than the fact that the velocities were a little bit all over the place, standard deviation was 37.9, right? So it, it wasn't looking good, but it was good enough to where I felt like, ah, screw it, let's go ahead and shoot the next row. And that was the bad choice, man. So here's the piece where we popped the primer, bent rim, huge burr, got raised up by a very deep ejector smear. The rim is also bent on the extractor side. Like this was just completely insane. And I wouldn't expect any different at 3,640 feet per second. Good grief. That was just crazy. And there were a couple other pieces that weren't a whole lot better. Here's one. And that one's not too bad. I don't feel anything raised up, but pretty much all of them you can see. Pretty big ejector smears, some, some lines on the ejector side and some smearing. There's another piece that got pretty darn banged up. And I think this one actually raised the primer up a little bit there. It probably came pretty close to popping. So this was just way over pressure. Shooting a half grain increment at charges this high were just extremely stupid. Yep, that piece is a little nicked up as well. So I don't remember which one was the first one that I shot, the one that I inspected and said, ah, eh, sure, let's go ahead and shoot the rest. Because all of them have got clear signs of problems, I should have stopped after that first shot. But I'm an idiot. All right, the next row was our... First charge with Power Pro 2000 MR. These aren't bad. I think uh, a couple of them had, yep, yeah, little bit of smearing, couple shiny spots, but the primers were halfway decent. I think this was probably the worst piece. Yeah, there's another guy, pretty decent little ejector smear. So this was 35 grains of, of Power Pro 2000 MR. I think backing off just a little bit. Like I mentioned, I think we could probably maybe shoot 3,400 feet per second with this powder. I don't know. We'll, we'll back it off and do a good bit more testing because I really loved the tighter velocities. Like our extreme spreads with the two Power Pro 2000 MR charges, the first one was 35 feet per second, the second one was 24. Those are extreme spreads. The standard deviations were 16.4 and 9.7. So pretty good stuff. Here's our max charge with Power Pro 2000 MR. No burrs, eh, maybe, maybe a little bit of one on that. Let's 
Kind of zoom in there just a touch. See if we see any rim bend. Eh, I can't really tell from here, but if there is, it, it's pretty slight. And this load was crazy, 3,502 feet per second. Like that's, uh, it's just nuts. And our last loads with IMR 4451, there's nothing to show you. These were all very low velocities, didn't leave any real marks on the, on the case head. So what's the damage? Of course, this is a junk piece of brass, and I think I'll probably need to junk one or two more from this row. I think the Power Pro 2000 MR ones are probably okay. That one that we found a little burr on, maybe I'll need to junk it. But I think, like, we certainly still got 25 good pieces. We'll see how it goes. And I do have three more pieces of new Hager brass. Actually, this one's been fired once, and then these two are are new so maybe we can throw away three and stick with 30 pieces i don't know we'll see how it goes i'll talk about that in the next video all right so let's move on and have a look at our groups overall accuracy was excellent today even cfe 223 like that first load was a 0 0.540 inch group so if we backed off cfe 223 a little bit and explore that 31 to 33 grain range there's probably some really good shooting loads in there. I just don't like how this velocity was all over the place. Those extreme spread numbers are awful and it makes me nervous. I mean, you saw what happens. The velocities get unpredictable and all of a sudden one of your shots is, you know, fricking 3,640 feet per second and blowing primers. Another thing that the temperature on this range day, I think it was about 50 degrees. It was a pretty warm day for February, but if I worked up these loads in February and then tried to shoot them in July, we're really going to run into pressure problems because CFE 223 and pretty much any spherical powder is just not going to be that temperature stable. And you always need to keep that in mind. Leave yourself a little bit of a buffer for when the weather gets hot. So of course the group went to crap there with the 33.5 grain load when the pressure, we were way over pressure. I actually found one of the tips, one of the bullet tips was stuck in the paper target. So I think these bullets started coming apart on me. Well, I know they did, right? We ended up with a freaking bullet tip stuck sideways in the target. So this was just nothing but bad news with CFE 223. Power Pro 2000 MR was very promising. If it wasn't for that last shot in the first group, the 35.0 grain group, that last shot went out to the right. It opened it up to a 0.894 inch group. Still not terrible, but if you look at kind of the four shot, the, the four good shots in that group, plus the five shot group in the next group of 0.346 inches, I am really liking what I'm seeing with Power Pro 2000 MR. We were too hot. Like these velocities, I, I wouldn't want to be shooting this all the time, but we could work up a 3350 to 3400 load that would maybe leave us enough buffer for pressure changes with temperature and all that stuff. Like this is all good here. Basically the exact opposite of CFE 223. It was all good with Power Pro 2000 MR. The standard deviation numbers of 16.4 and 9.7 are as good as I would have hoped for out of this powder. So really good stuff. Then IMR 4451, like ah, eh, who gives a crap? The velocities were super low. The groups were decent, 0.686 and 0 0.570 but it doesn't really matter because that's just the wrong powder choice. We'll, we'll revisit IMR 4451 whenever we get to some heavier bullets. I think especially like maybe once we get up to the 77, start working a little bit on the 77, 4451 and H4350 and Reloader 17 maybe. I expect those powders to really shine with the heavier stuff. So overall, so this, this video was a bit of a freaking dumpster fire, right? Honestly, when I look back at the load data, I still feel good about the charges I chose. I should have shot two powders. We should have shot two powders today and had 15 shots and maybe done four tenths of grain increments. Covered a little bit more ground and had slightly smaller jumps. I should have been smart enough to stop after the first shot with the top charge of CFE 223. All of those pieces of brass have pressure signs. I should have stopped after the first shot. Power Pro 2000 MR and IMR 4451, those were okay. But when you're doing like I did and just working off of no load data, just experience with the powder and a wild guess, each one of those should have been their own video, right? You know, 30, 30 shots, Three tenths of a grain increments really cover more ground and work up slowly. So mistakes were definitely made here. There's no doubt about that. But I feel like we learned a lot. And I think in the next video, we'll continue to shoot the Varmageddon and we'll try and narrow in on a good load with Power Pro 2000 MR perhaps. Because I've decided I want to go ahead and keep going with this cartridge, with this 22 Nosgar configuration. I went ahead and ordered a batch of brass. You have to order 500 of them. 
So it's pretty expensive, but I just started thinking it through. I've already got the dies. I've already got a nice barrel and I really like the performance improvement this cartridge shows over 223. And I don't really have a varmint gun. If I wanted to go groundhog or prairie dog hunting or something like that, my 223 is really my best option. And that's a good option, you know, for crying out loud, 223 is awesome, but so is 22 Nosler. I mean, this barrel's shooting well. So why should I waste a perfectly good shooting barrel by abandoning a cartridge? That, that doesn't make much sense, does it? So I ordered, I ordered 500 pieces of brass. So we'll be able to maybe cover the forming process a little bit better. In probably the next video, I should have the brass here within just a couple days. I ordered 250 more of these Nosler Varmageddons. Like I mentioned, I want to I want to continue to work on a load with PowerPro 2000 MR. I want to see if there are any extruded powders we can try that will get us anywhere close to these velocity numbers, like maybe AR Comp or Vitavori N540 or Vitavori N140. So we've got more powders to play with. And actually, since I'll have more brass, I'll probably go to a 50, 50 shot video format, kind of like my normal videos. And maybe we'll, for the next couple videos, we'll dedicate 25 shots to finalizing a load with PowerPro 2000 MR. And then we'll spend the other 25 shots exploring, you know, some other powders. I think that'll be fun. Now, don't expect this gun to be replacing 223 on my channel. We're still going to have plenty of 223. We're, we're going to have more 223 videos than we have 22 Nosgar videos because that's what you guys shoot. Those videos do well. I enjoy 223. Like there's, it's all good when it comes to 223, but I feel like 22 Nosgar has a place in my, kind of my hunting arsenal. So you'll definitely be seeing it from time to time as we go forward. But here in the short term, there's gonna be, you know, quite a few more. But once it starts to get a little bit boring, the videos may get, you know, few and far between. So does that about cover it? I think that's about it. I hope the Velocity whiners are happy now. I'm sure they'll just move on to something else to complain about. And I probably shouldn't take the bait when they get to run in their mouth, but I don't know. For some reason, man, that last video, the comments in that last video just kind of got to me. And I shouldn't let that happen. So I'll try and be better. So that's it, folks. I'll see you guys next time.